So the only question becomes, which of these is going to be more convenient for us to draw? Well, there's a, the, uh, many instructors prefer to write it like this. Many instructors prefer this form. And the reason they prefer it is it puts the negative charge on the more electronegative atom on the oxygen rather than the carbon. So maybe this resonance structure does get more weight in determining the structure of the molecule. So they consider this the favored resonance structure. However, for beginning students, this isn't really the best resonance structure to draw for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's just a little bit more complicated. Notice here we only needed two arrows, whereas here we needed three arrows. So this is just a little bit simpler. But more important, now, now that we've deprotonated the aldehyde, should that make it electrophilic or nucleophilic? Now that we've deprotonated the ketone, are these going to be nucleophilic or electrophilic? They're going to be uh, uh, nucleophilic. Because they have negative charges. Positive charges would make them electrophilic, but negative charges make them want to donate electrons as nucleophiles. Well, according to this resonance structure, who's going to be the nucleophilic atom? Carbon. The alpha carbon. The alpha. Right. But according to this resonance <coughs> structure, who would be the nucleophilic atom? Carbonyl oxygen. That's right. But it turns out that in this course, you're almost never going to see a reaction where this oxygen acts like the nucleophile. We were talking about that a little bit earlier. Instead, 100% or maybe almost 100% of the reactions will be this carbon being a nucleophile. So for beginning students, this can be a very misleading resonance structure to draw. It, you can still get the problems right, but it just makes things more complicated because you keep putting the negative charge in a place that doesn't indicate how the molecule is going to react. So um, on the blackboard, I'm gonna always going to draw this version over here. And that's what I would uh, suggest that you should do. But you should keep in mind that oftentimes in the book, you might see these resonance structures drawn. We just have to get accustomed to the fact that there's more than one legal way to write the mechanisms. Uh, if, if the two pictures differ by resonance, they're, they're the same thing. This is a very important type of molecule now, a molecule where uh, a deprotonated aldehyde or ketone. Deprotonated aldehydes and ketones are very important, so we need to have a name for this type of compound. Well, these are called enolates. Either one of them, doesn't matter where the charge is, they're, they're both. That's right, because remember, since they're resonant structures of each other, they should be considered the same thing. Okay. Since they're resonant structures, they should be considered the same thing, so they must be given the same name. That's, the, that's what this double-headed arrow means. These are really two different ways of writing the same exact thing. It's just that, in my opinion, this is the more helpful way to write it. But they're both perfectly accurate. So this is also considered an enolate. So that's uh, something we have to take into account. There's two different ways an enolate can look. An enolate can look like a carbon-carbon double bond connected to a negative oxygen. Or it can look like a carbonyl connected to a negative alpha carbon. So we just have to make flashcards and learn that these are the two things that enolates can look like. Now we should learn why these are called enolates. Well, let's think about what would happen if we protonated this oxygen. If we protonated this oxygen, if we protonated this oxygen, we would get a compound that looks like this. Now, the name of this compound is an enol. Enol. And we should be able to see why that is a very logical name. That's a name that should be extremely easy to remember. Because you have an alcohol and it's a double bond. That's right. And, and what's the name for that carbon-carbon double bond? <coughs> what, what type of functional group is it's that? Alkene. An alkene. So now we can understand the two parts of this name. It's called ene to indicate the carbon-carbon double bond, the alkene portion. And it's called all because the alcohol is on that alkene. So this is called an enol. This is something else we need to make a flashcard of and learn this name for. So this is called an enol. And you might have noticed that in chemistry, oftentimes the ionic form of a compound ends in eight, like sulfate or nitrate. Well, here we have the ionic form of an enol, so it's called an enolate. You can clearly see this picture definitely looks like a deprotonated enol. The hard part is to remember why this is called an enolate, because it doesn't look that much like an enol anymore because of the resonance. Um, but this is also an enolate because it has a resonance structure, which looks like a deprotonated enol. I've noticed that a common mistake people make is they confuse enolates and enols. A lot of the time when I draw this picture, the student will say, oh, that's an enol, which is wrong. It's an enolate. Or if I draw this picture, a student might say, this is enolate. So remember, the enol is the neutral, protonated, fully protonated form. And the enolate is the thing that has two separate resonance structures and which is the deprotonated form. Okay. 
Incidentally, so what we're covering now is still from the chapter on aldehydes and ketones, which was your chapter 16. Uh, and we're covering that now because um, there's some important stuff that you'll probably be testing on the quiz and on the, the next midterm after this. But also, it's important to keep in mind that then you're going to have later on, after the midterm, an entire chapter about the reaction of enolates. So this is something that is very important for us to, to understand very thoroughly, because it's not just going to be on the next test, but then there'll be a whole chapter just about how enolates can react. So we want to take our time and make sure we understand this. Enolate, enolate, enol. And is there a special name for those reactions? Uh, let's see. Well, there's a bunch of different reactions, so they'll have different names. But they'll all have one thing in common, which is that they all are nucleophilic attacks by enolates. Okay. Remember that an enolate is a nucleophile. So what we're going to have to do now is we're going to have to think about all the different electrophiles that an enolate can attack. All the different electrophiles that an enolate can attack. Now, actually, we'll mainly get into that when we get to that, that, that chapter in the future. For now, we're mainly we're going to talk about the basics. All right. So my suggestion for when you deprotonate the alpha carbon is that you just use this simple mechanism. And you just show the electrons ending up on the alpha carbon. But you need to know that oftentimes in the book, in the answer key, it might be written in this more complicated mechanism where the negative charge migrates all the way up to the oxygen. Both of those are perfectly legal. Notice that what we had happening here is we had a base taking a proton from this carbon. So was this carbon here acting like an acid or a base? In this reaction, did this carbon act like an acid or a base? Because like it was donating its proton. Acids donate protons. After all, this is the base over here. Mm -hmm. So we could say this alpha carbon was acidic. Or we could say this alpha hydrogen is acidic. This is also called the alpha hydrogen because it's on the alpha carbon. Now that should strike you as a little weird because previously we've never thought of carbons as being acidic. We've never talked about carbons as being acidic and losing protons. There must be something unusual about this carbon that allows it to lose its proton because carbons don't usually act like acids. Well, we can understand, what, um, what, why don't carbons like to lose their protons? Because it leaves them with a negative charge. And carbons don't really like having negative charges. They're not that nucleophilic. There must be something that is giving extra stability to this negative charge. Then this negative charge must be more stable than carbon, than carbon anions usually are. Well, we've already kind of already kind of given the explanation for why this is a more stable negative charge than us usual. What is it that is stabilizing the negative charge on this alpha carbon? Resonance. That's right. It's the fact that there's another resonance structure where the negative charge isn't on the alpha carbon. It's on the oxygen up here. So even if you don't draw this resonance structure, you need to know in the back of your mind that it exists, because otherwise we don't understand how we were able to deprotonate this alpha carbon. We can't just go around deprotonating any carbon we want. Only this particular carbon has the resonance stabilization after it's deprotonated. That's just another indication of how important resonance is in this term. We're going to keep using resonance to explain things. So the reason we're able to form enolates in the first place is that they're resonance stabilized. That's a very important point. We can deprotonate the alpha carbon because it's resonance stabilized. Because the enolate that's formed then is resonance stabilized. this type of functional group? Uh, that is an enol. That's right. Not an enolate, but an enol. Now notice that both of these are three carbon chains. I think I'm going to keep putting in the asterisks that we've been putting in the past. Asterisks for the carbonyl, carbon, and oxygen, or the former carbonyl, carbon, and oxygen. And now we're going to maybe start labeling the alpha carbon as well. I think we've seen how helpful it is to have labels for the carbonyl, carbon, and oxygen. But now it's going to be very helpful to keep labeling the alpha, or I don't know if this is really considered an alpha carbon here, because there's no more carbonyl, but this is the former alpha carbon. No, no, no. All right, so that's the former alpha carbon, so I'll, I'll put in that symbol alpha over there. So the important thing to see is that ketones can turn into enols. And enols can turn into ketones. That is called tautomerism. And that's an important reaction, tautomerism. That's an equilibrium reaction. Based on the arrows that I drew, in equilibrium, are we going to have more of the ketone or more of the enol? 
more of the ketone. Yeah, usually there's a lot more of the ketone than of the enol. Nevertheless, it's very important to know that the ketones are always occasionally flipping into enols, and then the enols quickly flip back into ketones. These are constantly flipping back and forth, although in most situations, at most times, the greater proportion will be in the ketone state. And this reaction, again, is called tautomerism. Ta Hard to spell. Tautomerism. 